Jerry and welcome to my channel Jerry in Stitches and welcome to my balcony. This channel um, kind of takes you on a journey for my sewing adventures and in the past two weeks I've been really busy with this refashioning project and basically I just dyed this shirt jacket shacket. Um, I over dyed it actually and, and with a very special tie-dye um, technique called stitched shibori and this technique creates like a, a wood grain pattern that you see on the sleeve and also on the pocket and the special thing that I did with it is that I used this wood grain pattern on a grid and created my own plaid pattern pretty cool anyway we're gonna go into a deep dive on how I created this pattern a lot of it I learned from this book called stitched Shibori by Jane Callender. Go get it if you want. Uh, and before we jump in, remember to subscribe to my channel, give me a like, uh, send me a comment, and remember to follow me on Instagram, Jerry in Stitches, and check out my blog, jerryinstitches.com. So before this happened, it actually looked something like this, which you see on the picture right now and I wasn't really happy with it and so I kind of took it along for some kind of refashioning process. The first reason for dyeing this garment is how this blech shade of green makes me look sickly and the shacket looks like it's an elevated hospital gown and I only realized this after I sewed up the shacket and put it on. The sewing pattern is the Fiber Mood Ria by Fiber Mood and I love the shape but I hate the fabric. So dyeing it would be a sustainable refashioning project. Second, the fabric has faded and stained spots. I thought this would give the garment character and ignore them but these spots are admittedly more shabby than chic. The first step of creating the wood grain shibori is drawing in the grid lines for the stitching pattern. I am going for a checked pattern with squares that are 5 inches wide. I've already drawn in my squares and I'll quickly go over how I drew them in with pattern matching in mind. I'm using a quilter's ruler and an erasable or washable marker to draw in the lines. For my shacket, I am starting the check pattern just below the pocket flaps in the front. So the first thing to do is to determine where the first horizontal line is going to be and draw that in. After that is done, the other horizontal lines can be drawn in at 5 inch intervals down the length of the whole shacket in the front pieces. Next, it's important to determine where the center front line is and mark that down the length of the garment. I've already drawn that in and the first two vertical lines to draw in would each be two and a half inches away from this center line on either side. Um, this would align the center of the five inch square with the center front line. From there, measure the next vertical line 5 inches away from the center and mark this down the length of the garment as well. Drawing in the horizontal and vertical lines would produce the 5 inch grid required as a stitching guide. To continue the grid lines on the sleeves, I put on my garment and eyeball where that first horizontal line hits and draw that in. The other horizontal lines can then be drawn parallel to that first line. But I've decided that all I need is the first line because the sleeves will have a different shibori pattern. To make sure that the pattern matching works between front and back bodices, I find a horizontal line on the side seam that would continue front to back. And from there, I can draw in more horizontal lines at 5 inch intervals above and below. The vertical lines in the back are determined by first finding the center back line, then measuring the grid lines from center. When I'm done drawing in the grid lines, this is what they look like on the garment and the pattern matching works front to back and with the sleeves. It is worth the time to accurately draw in this grid because the stitching will go much smoother once this is done. Strong nylon thread is the best thread for me to use for stitch shibori. This thread is used to sew up tents and thick canvases. A long slender needle is what I use for stitching because it's easier to load up multiple stitches on this kind of needle and this helps to cut down on the stitching time. Actually, I'm not so sure if nylon thread is the traditional thread that is used for stitch shibori, but through some experimentation, it works best for me. 
And after threading the needle, I tie knots at one end of the thread. I tie up at least two knots, sometimes even three knots, one on top of the other, so that it is bulky enough for the thread to stay secure on the fabric. I'm showing you the stitch pattern before we begin so that you understand how the check pattern is created. So when I flip it towards the back of the garment, you would see a column of long stitches and these long stitches together create a blank box. And right next to it are the running stitches that create the uh, wood grain box and then another column of long stitches to create another blank box. And in the front, this is what it looks like. Um, this is the blank box uh, followed by a wood grain box and then another blank box. I've already completed stitching the whole left front bodice. So I'm demonstrating on the right front bodice to show the actual stitching process. The first line of stitching starts on the first horizontal grid line. The one long stitch that creates the blank box will be in the back of the garment, so start the stitch with the needle piercing front to back. Then the needle comes back out to the front on the vertical line where the blank box meets the wood grain box. Here's the long stitch in the back. Here it is. Now I'm going to sew on the pattern for the wood grain box, which is created by a series of running stitches. The running stitches are each about one centimeter wide with an equal amount of spacing in between each running stitch. Now I am not terribly accurate with these running stitches, like the width of them, and you don't really have to be. And I stitch this running stitch up until the next vertical line, which is where the next blank box starts. And when I get there, I make sure that the needle is pointing front to back when I pierce the fabric there. You see, so that the long stitch of the next blank box will be in the back of the garment. To complete this long stitch, I direct the needle to come through from back to the front, ending at the side seam or uh, the next vertical line of the grid. And then to end off this line of stitching, I tie on at least two knots, one on top of the other, to bulk it up so that the stitches do not come undone and that the line of stitching is fully secure. Then I cut off the thread and then knot up the new end of the thread before I start stitching another row of stitches. The next row of stitching starts one centimeter below the row preceding it. The pathway of the long stitch for the blank box is exactly the same as the row above, meaning that the needle will first pierce it from front to back, then come back out back to front on the vertical grid line. Keep this stitching pattern throughout for all the long stitches. The next row for the wood grain box also starts one centimeter or half an inch from the one before it. However, the running stitches are stitched on in a staggered pattern in relationship to the first row. Uh, this means that I do my best not to line up the stitches with the row before it. This randomness will help define the wood grain pattern much better when it is dyed. Even though the running stitches are made in a horizontal direction in relationship to the garment, the wood grain lines will turn out in a meandering vertical pattern after we bind and dye the fabric. It's helpful to keep this in mind if the direction of the wood grain matters when you're planning your shibori design. It's also important to know that there's a right or wrong side to stitched shibori, and that is why I make sure that the long stitches for the blank boxes are running in the back of the garment always. This ensures that the fold created for the blank box will fold towards the front of the garment and not towards the back when the stitches are bound. So when I arrive at the next vertical line demarcating the start of the blank box, which alternates with the wood grain box, I make sure that the needle is piercing the fabric from front to back and then back to front. I sew on the next long stitch in the back of the blank box, then I tie knots the same way I did for the first row of stitching. 
So now I've just completed stitching on the two rows and I want to flip this over to show you the back side of the garment. So here are the long stitches that will create one blank box, then the rows of random running stitches that will create the wood grain box, then another set of long stitches that will create another blank box. If I do a quick bind of these first two rows, you will see the pattern formed on the fabric. Again, for the blank boxes, the fold will be made pointing towards the front and the wood grain boxes will have a wrinkled or pleated pattern created by the random running stitches. I will continue stitching the following lines of stitching throughout the length of the garment. In this case, I will sew on four more rows of check patterns, each row of wood grain boxes alternating with blank boxes. This is what it looks like when a full wood grain box is filled with random running stitches. And this is what the left front of the garment looks like when all four rows of check patterning is stitched on. For the left sleeve, I decided to do a whole section of wood grain patterning instead of the check pattern that I did for the bodices. This was actually the most challenging section to stitch on because it took forever. Just for this sleeve alone, I stitched on about 1,300 stitches and tied about 200 knots. Yes, stitch shibori requires quite a bit of labor and time, a certain level of patience, madness, and definitely a love for hand sewing. I divided sewing the lines of stitching into three major sections. You saw that the front was divided to left and right sections, and then you see me now sewing on the stitches for the back of the garment. For me, I go into a deep meditation when I am doing this, and I do my best to fully enjoy both the pain and pleasure of the slow stitching process. So after about 20 hours of stitching, here's the completed right front of the garment, and here's the back of the garment. To have some variation in the patterning, I decided to do stripes of uh, horse teeth shibori stitching below the four rows of check patterns on my garment. This pattern is also echoed on the collar. Um, here's the sleeve with the full wood grain pattern, and here's the other sleeve with more horse teeth shibori stripes. Before I pull the threads on one side to create a tight bind, I first have to secure the threads on one side so that I can really pull it as tightly as possible on the other side. I do this by first tying up the rows of threads in pairs on only one end. This is a double or triple knot just to make sure that there is no way the threads are going to be pulled through the fabric while doing a tight bind on the other ends of the threads. So I first tie up the threads in pairs down one side of the garment and when that's done then I'm ready to pull the threads to create the binding. Now I'm pulling the threads also in pairs so that I can create a tight bind. Pull as tightly as possible then secure the bind by tying two or three knots between each pair of threads. I find that it's easier to pull out all the threads first before tying the knots. This helps to create a tighter bind because the fabric is being coaxed to pleat or fold down the length of the whole garment. And when I've pulled them all, then I start to tie the knots between the pairs of threads. I also highly recommend wearing gloves, like latex gloves are probably the best gloves to use when you're doing this binding activity because quite a lot of friction is being caused between the pulling of the threads and the surface of your skin, so the gloves will protect you. You don't see me doing it in this video right now, but I do use them later on when it started to get a little bit too uncomfortable for um, the skin on my hands while I'm doing this. So definitely use gloves to protect your hands when you are pulling and binding these threads. And here's a quick look at the folds that you've created through the binding. Here's the wood grain and the blank boxes. Here's a peek at the wood grain sleeve that has been bound and here's the whole garment when it is completely bound. You can see the pleats of the wood grain pattern alternating with the bigger folds for the blank boxes and on the collar the folds of the horse teeth shibori bind. This fabric is now ready to be dyed and I've chosen Rit Dye Back to Black Dye Kit which includes a jet black dye and a color fixative. And here's the monster before we put it in the dye bath. 
Okay, so a half cup of salt and one teaspoon of dishwashing liquid goes into about six liters of almost boiling water. This is the stovetop method of dyeing and this is how I prepare the dye bath before I put in the dye. Then I measure out about 120 milliliters of dye and make sure that every drop goes into the dye bath and stir it up really good. And I'm also keeping the fire simmering as I am dying. Right around now as I'm stirring, I start to offer up my prayers to the dye gods and goddesses for a successful dye job. Then I submerge the stitched and bound fabric into the cauldron and keep my fingers crossed, wishing for the best. I am dyeing the garment for 5 minutes, uh, but for the most vibrant color, 30 minutes in the bath is recommended. But I don't really want the resist pattern to take on too much black or start to turn grey, so I am doing a 5 minute quickie in the dye bath. Keep the fabric moving in the bath, then remove it after the intended dye time. Then I prepare the color fixative bath. Do not, and I say do not, skip this important step in the dyeing process. And 120 milliliters of dye fixative goes into 6 liters of water, which is simmering. And immediately after dyeing, I place the dyed garment into this bath. This takes about 20 minutes for the fixative to do its magic as the fabric is percolating. After that, I launder the garment, rinsing and washing in cold water when it is still bound. I also dry the bound garment in the dryer until damp. Then I take it out and then I am ready to reveal the unbound patterns. I use a seam ripper to rip out the threads that have created this binding. And this has to be done patiently as well to prevent ripping of the fabric. And it's another slow and somewhat agonizing part of the whole process, but oh so gratifying as well when the wood grain pattern is revealed. Oh my god, it's hard stopping. The stitching, binding and unbinding took up at least 30 hours of labor and I estimate that I sewed at least 30,000 stitches and tied at least 3,000 knots to create this shibori design. I can't say that it was easy going all the time. Some moments were really challenging because of the repetitive movements that were required. This project was made possible by Ritz Dye as part of a collaboration on Instagram for their Back to Black Dye Kit campaign. It came in a timely manner because I've been wanting to refashion this shacket. It's a great way to bring old and unloved clothes back to life and in the limelight again. I'm so happy! Thanks so much for joining me on this episode. See you on the next installment. And in the meantime, keep dancing. Happy sewing and happy stitching!